Good morning, brothers and sisters. It's an honor for me to be able to speak with you today. And uh, though I've only been at Ensign College for a few months now, since July when I came here, I see so many dear friends and people who I have the opportunity to work with who I love so much. And I'm grateful for your support today and for your vested interest in praying for me that uh, my nervous heart can calm down and I can deliver the message the Lord has inspired me to uh, share with you today. I wanted to say thank you to Justin for his prayer uh, that helped me so much, and I'm grateful for that beautiful music. It's interesting how many times when you speak, the Lord will uh, inspire somebody to choose a hymn that's just precious to you, and that's one of my very favorites, both in music and the words that go with it. So thank you, Seth and Rebecca, Jimena and Enoch. I appreciate your uh, help with that. As I contemplated what I might share with you today, I thought of the mission of Ensign College, and I wondered how can we uh, truly become capable and trusted disciples of Jesus Christ? And uh, I would like to share with you a few things that helped me in my quest and in my effort to become a better disciple of Jesus Christ. One of my favorite sayings, and it's all over my house, is choose your heart. And I first heard this saying a few years ago from my stake president who heard it from a sister missionary serving in our area. As she explained it, life was meant to be hard, not easy. Uh, we get to choose our heart, and that can either be something hard we do today, or it's going to be a harder consequence that we'll have to face in the future. You might have heard some people say, you can do hard things, but I'd say you must choose to do hard things, because if you don't, it will be even harder later. Let me give you a few examples of what I mean. We can choose to take care of our bodies and our health, and that's hard. Or we can become obese, unhealthy, and suffer the problems associated with that lifestyle, and that's harder. We can choose to work hard and spend less than we earn, and that's hard. Or we can overspend, live in debt, and feel a lot of stress, and that's harder. We can invest in our relationships, or we can feel lonely, and we can struggle with those things. We can study, pray, and keep our covenants, and that's hard. Or we can struggle spiritually and miss the joy that comes from living the gospel, and that's harder. We can repent and live worthy, and that's hard. Or we can live without the Spirit, struggling with our decisions, not having the peace and comfort that comes from the Lord, and that's harder. Choosing our hard is an eternal principle. All actions and lack of actions come with consequences. Sometimes the heart chooses us, and we have to choose how we're going to respond. Think of Nephi, who was told by his father that the Lord had told him he needed to return to Jerusalem to get the plates from Laban. He responded, I will go and do the things which the Lord hath, hath commanded, for I know he giveth no commandments unto the children of men, save he shall prepare a way for them that they may accomplish the thing that he hath commanded them. Nephi chose his hard and with, had had faith that the Lord would prepare a way for him to accomplish what was hard for him. Do you remember what Sister Cush told us just a few weeks ago? She said, quote, Be grateful for the gift of opposition, for challenges, for hard things. They smooth out our rough edges, turn us to God, and help us appreciate a beautiful, warm, sunny day. End quote. Jesus Christ is the greatest example we have of choosing our heart. He volunteered to come to earth and to be the Savior in the great premortal council. He was born in a conquered nation in humble circumstances with a feeding trough for his very first bed. He then went and fasted 40 days in the wilderness to commune with his father. He didn't succumb to any of Satan's temptations. He chose his heart over and over during his life and ministry. And when the time came for his great atoning sacrifice, it was harder than any of us could ever comprehend. And it was hard for him. He prayed, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Then later, in that same time, he prayed, O oh my Father, if this cup may not pass from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. The pain and agony were so great that he sweat great drops of blood as he took upon him our sins, our pains, our sorrows, and our sufferings. He chose his heart, and in so doing, he saved every one of us, all mankind. And then he had to choose another heart the very next day, going through the scourging, the beating, the insults, the scorn, finally submitting and choosing to be crucified. 
He had the power and the choice not to do these things, but he chose his heart and fulfilled his mission, doing everything Heavenly Father asked him to do. Well, what hard things do you need to choose? Think about it. Marriage, childbirth, living the law of chastity, going on a mission, staying faithful and active in the church when somebody offends you, or maybe you don't understand some element of the doctrine. These are hard things. Just remember, choosing your heart now results in joy and a better life later. A few weeks ago, Elder Bednar spoke to us and shared that the essence of mortality is to gain experience and change from the natural man, not stay the same as we are today. I think that's our greatest heart. It lasts our whole life. It never ends. It's the essence of our mission to repent and change, become reborn, and become converted. This has to happen to us individually, as families, and as a people. President Nelson has been sending that message to us that we need to change and be converted, and he's been sending it to us that loudly and clearly in recent years. He's taught repentance is the process of change. We need to change to become more like Jesus Christ. Make your focus daily repentance. Do the spiritual work to find out for yourselves that this is the Savior's church, or the Savior's restored church. He said, time is running out. Let God prevail. The Lord needs a willing and worthy people to prepare the world for the second coming. Start today to increase your faith. This takes effort. He said, get on the covenant path and stay there. Know your identity as a child of God, a child of the covenant, and disciples of Jesus Christ. Truly, our prophet has consistently told us the same message Elder Bednar has told us. We need to change, repent, and become better. We need to be worthy and follow the Lord. Now, the only way we can do this is through Jesus Christ and his great atoning sacrifice. We need to be like King Lamoni's father, willing to give up all our sins to know God. It's hard. We have to choose it. We have to prioritize it. We know no unclean thing can enter into the kingdom of God. But it all seems unattainable, doesn't it, for us to be perfect and to be clean and to be pure and ready? And it is. It's impossible. It's impossible for us to do it on our own because we're natural men and women. We're living in a fallen world. We're surrounded by the adversary and his servants that tempt us on every hand. And for us, it would be impossible. But as the Savior reaffirmed multiple times with God, all things are possible. So we have to do it with God. Both Isaiah and Malachi compared the Savior and the effects of the atonement to a refiner's fire. May I share with you a personal experience I have with refiner's fire? When I was around 17, I worked in a bronze foundry here in Salt Lake City. We made some beautiful articles. I was the head caster, meaning I was the man that handled the bronze. And uh, the process began by heating up bricks of bronze in a special crucible, which were placed in a blast furnace. The heat from that furnace was tremendous. I wore multiple winter coats, forwards and backwards, just to, and, and along with an asbestos shield and the aprons and gloves, just to protect me so that my body or my clothes didn't catch fire. We'd heat the bronze until it became molten and a bright orange, around 1,800 degrees Fahrenheit. But it has to get hotter. It has to get almost 2,000 degrees, and it becomes whiter and bright, brighter and white hot. During that last phase, before you pour it into the waiting molds, the impurities will separate from the bronze. You'll see them as little streams of black swirling around in the white hot bronze. You can stir the bronze with a metal rod to try to get the impurities out, but they won't adhere to the steel rod because they're still blended in with the bronze. They're still part of it. So you need a catalyst to change things. At that stage, I had to put in a small chunk of zinc into the molten bronze. As soon as I did that, the bronze would instantly melt and flare up, and suddenly the impurities, all those little swirls of black, would rise to the top. Now I could take the steel rod, stir the bronze, and the impurities would all adhere to the rod. I could pull it out, knock them off, and the bronze would be pure and beautiful, ready to pour. It takes both the zinc and the heat to transform the bronze, and so it is with us. We first activate the atonement of Christ through faith, repentance, and making the covenant of baptism. We commit to always remember him, to take his name upon us and keep his commandments. That's like the catalyst of the zinc. Only then can the Lord baptize us with fire and the Holy Ghost, 
fully purifying us, removing our impurities, and preparing us to be molded into whatever Heavenly Father would have us be, preparing us to meet Him and for celestial glory. When we make the effort to keep this covenant, the Savior's Atonement can cleanse us, ridding us of all our sins and impurities that are ingrained in us and swirl around as part of our lives today. When we strive to live with Him in our lives, He can change us from an impure natural man to a pure spirit-led version of ourselves. He can break the chains of our bad habits, break the chains of our addictions, our natural appetites, help us conquer our lusts, help us replace selfishness with selflessness. We begin the process of becoming like Him, and we have hope that there will be a joyful future in our lives. Now might be a good time for each of us to pause for a minute and just think, how are we doing personally? Let's reflect on it just for a moment. How do you feel? Do you feel white and clean and pure today, ready to meet the Lord in His glory? Would you feel great, the great joy and anticipation of being able to be back in His presence? Or would we, as said in the scriptures, feel like we would shrink from His presence and want the rocks to fall on us and hide us, acknowledging our guilt for the things that we do wrong? Maybe you are struggling. Maybe you feel inside that you're struggling with some difficult sin or addiction, a weakness or a challenge. Maybe you've tried over and over and you feel exhausted and hopeless. Maybe you feel you've fallen so far that the blessings and the promises you've received previously are lost forever and that they're gone. You might feel it's too late for you to repent. Or maybe you think the pain of going through that process would be too harmful to you or your spouse, your children, your loved ones, or parents as your sins might be exposed. Maybe it's better just we give up and do what everybody else does and just live like the world. After all, other people do it. And maybe you could explain it all when you face Christ and you have a chance at the judgment seat. Maybe you just fall on His mercy then. My dear friends, those are all the messages the adversary gives us when he tries to get us to delay choosing our heart. He tells us to give up, to stop trying, that it's too late, we can't do it, that it's too hard. Just wait. That's what he tells us. But what does God say? Well, Jesus taught it perfectly in Luke 15 in the parable of the prodigal son. If you'll allow me to paraphrase it just a little bit, the first part of the story. A son decided he'd had enough of living at home with his father and his family. He wanted what the world had to offer, so he asked his father to give him his inheritance right then. He left everything behind, went into a far land, and he lived riotously. And he partook of all the things that the world offered that he'd been sheltered from and protected from at home. Money and virtue spent, the son found himself caught up in a famine and impoverished. So he became a servant to a local man feeding his pigs. The son was starving. He was so hungry that he wished he could eat the husks and the slops that he was feeding to the pigs. At long last, he came to himself. He woke up. He realized he was a child of a loving father that he had rejected. And he would be a lot better if he just went back home. True, he had already spent his inheritance, so he couldn't be an heir or have status in the household anymore. And maybe there would be a hard price to pay of humiliation, or even worse, but it had to be better than this. So he came up with what he'd say as he met his father. He would say, Father, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. He hoped it would work. He chose his heart, and he started his long walk back home. Now, quoting from Luke's account of the Savior's parable, And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion, and ran, and fell upon his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and I am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand, and shoes on his feet, and bring forth the fatted calf, and kill it. Let us eat, and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. For me, that phrase, when he was yet a long way off, the father ran to him, brings great hope and understanding. The Lord doesn't wait to help us until we have arrived. He doesn't wait until we're fully repented and perfect. He runs to us as soon as we turn to him, with help, with shoes, robes, ring, and food, whatever we need 
to return back to him. As the Lord told Moroni, his grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before him. We're all prodigals at some point. We all make mistakes and sin. What a blessing to know our Heavenly Father and Savior stand waiting for us to come to ourselves so they can run to us and help us return. I promise you that if you will make the effort to try, the Lord will come to you with the help you need to return to the path. Don't wait. Choose your heart. Now Alma shared that through his repentance experience, which was severe, he learned that Jesus Christ is the only way and the only means to be saved. You might ask yourself as you think about your journey back, but how can he, why would he do this for me? After all I've done wrong, after all the mistakes I've made, after all the evil I've experienced, why would he do this for me? And the answer is simple. He loves you. He loves you. How much? Well, so much that our Heavenly Father gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus didn't come to earth and do all that he did so he could condemn you. He came to save you. He came to bring you back because he loves you. We can never do it alone, but we can do all things with Christ. Now, may I share with you two important principles that might increase your hope and motivate you to come to yourself and choose your heart? First principle, God has all power. He can do anything, create anything, fix anything. He operates by eternal laws, and he can do all things necessary to fulfill his plans and accomplish his work, which is to bring about our immortality and eternal life. Second, God knows all things, past, present, and future. Now, this, present, this principle is a little bit hard for, me, for us to understand because we live in linear time, where only this instant is present, and everything before this instant is now the past, and everything ahead of this instant is the future, but not so with him. His course is one eternal round. All things are present before him. He sees the end from the beginning. Now, we could spend a lot of time exploring the implications of these two things put together, but let's just recognize he knows everything that's going to happen in all things. So when we combine those, what does that mean? It means he knows all of what our choices we're going to make, good and bad. Now, that doesn't diminish in any way the importance of your choices or predestine us in some way, and it doesn't minimize the, your opportunity to choose. Quite the opposite. What it means is that a merciful Heavenly Father and our kind elder brother Jesus Christ know what will happen and they prepare the way for us to do all we're supposed to do. They prepare the path for us to succeed and be blessed. And as we enter the path, we don't see the end or why he is having us do what he asks. That's really only apparent in hindsight. Brother Marshall talked about this a few weeks ago. The scriptures are full of examples that you can study and ponder that prove this is true. There's the story of Joseph in Egypt, the story of Moses in the Exodus, the story of Esther, who was prepared for the day with the king. Right? There's many others. You'll find lots of stories that show that Heavenly Father knew what was going to happen and prepared the way, despite the imperfections of his servants. Now, let's look at two specific examples together. First, Heavenly Father knew, God knew Jerusalem would be destroyed and the Jews would be carried away into Babylon because of their wickedness. So he prepared a way for Lehi and his family to be safe and brought to a promised land. There are so many examples of how the Lord's omniscience and omnipotence prepared the way in their story. First, he saved Lehi from the mobs. He told them to leave and get out. Second, he had Lehi send back his sons to get the brass plates. That had to happen so it would preserve both their knowledge of God and also their language. Do you remember what Nephi said? He said that he was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things that he should do. He had to find the path. Third, he prepared a Lehona that would guide them through the wilderness and the optimum paths, even leading them across the seas, helping them to find the path that would take them to food and protect them from danger. They learned they had to stay righteous if they were going to hear the Lord's voice. The fourth thing he did is he taught them, how, by, and he, through his spirit, how to use curious workmanship to build a seaworthy vessel that could, that could go clear across the ocean and take their family to the Americas. And fifth, he had them keep a record, a Book of Mormon, 
that would fulfill prophecy and serve as a second witness of Jesus Christ, which is a critical part of the restoration of the gathering of Israel. Truly, God knew everything that they would need, all the things they would do, and he prepared the way for them. He, they, they made a lot of mistakes along the way, and he didn't remove the consequences of those mistakes, but he prepared the way, if they repented and would follow him, that they could make it. Now, the second example I want to share with you, and probably the best example of this principle for each of us, comes from the early history of the church and the life of the prophet Joseph Smith. So think of Joseph Smith when he received the place. It was after four years of instruction, testing, mistakes, repentance. Finally, Joseph received the gold plates from the angel Moroni September 22nd in 1827. It took time and hard work for Joseph to develop his ability as a seer and to have that gift of seership and translation. By April of 1828, he and his now expectant wife Emma were living in Harmony, Pennsylvania, and, they had, and Joseph had translated the first part of the Book of Mormon with Emma acting as his scribe, but it was slow going. They both had to work. That's what life was like back then, and there wasn't a lot of time to get everything done, and now Emma was pregnant and it didn't feel very well. Martin Harris came and began to act as scribe April 12th of that year, and the work accelerated rapidly. They were translating the Book of Lehi, the first part of the large plates. By early June, the handwritten manuscript had reached 116 pages. These pages were 13 and a half inches high by about 17 inches wide. Scholars estimate that if we had those things, if they had been published, they would have been around 300 printed pages. Now, once they reached this stage, Martin, who was under a lot of pressure from his wife and others, who didn't believe that the record even existed, asked Joseph if he would ask the Lord if he could take the transcript and go show it to them as evidence of its truthfulness. Joseph didn't like the idea, but he agreed to pray to the Lord. So he took it to the Lord and asked him, and the Lord said no. Martin pressed his request again, and the Lord again said no. Martin begged Joseph to try one more time, and Joseph did. And this time the Lord gave conditional permission if Martin promised to only show it to five designated people and the covenant to obey the word of the Lord, which he did. Joseph gave him the manuscript June 14th, and Martin left for Palmyra. Now, how would Joseph feel later that day when the angel Moroni appeared to him and had him give him back the Urim and Thummim? Because that's what happened. He had to give back the, the, uh, the tools, the translators, that say, the interpreters that same day. The following day, Emma delivered a baby boy, Alvin, who was sickly and ill. And Alvin didn't even live through the day. So now Joseph had two really hard things happen at the same time. Emma was really weak and ill after, after the birth of their son who passed away. Joseph took care of her for almost two weeks and so they mourned the loss of that little boy. During that time, they heard nothing from Martin, who was supposed to be back by then. Emma grew increasingly restless, as did Joseph, and they were worried about what was going on with the manuscript. She pled for Joseph to leave and go back to Palmyra to retrieve the manuscript, which he did. So upon arriving in Palmyra, Joseph sent a message to Martin, who lived about three miles away, to come join them for breakfast, and he didn't arrive. He was supposed to be there at 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock passed. Finally, four hours later, Martin came, slowly walking up towards their house with his head hanging down. Upon sitting down at the table, Martin dropped his head and sobbed, I've lost my soul. I've lost my soul. Joseph asked him, you haven't lost the manuscript, have you? Martin said, yes, he had. Joseph said, we need to go right now and search and go find it. Martin said, it's no use. I've already searched the house. I've torn up the floorboards. I've ripped out the walls. There's, it's not there. It's nowhere. Joseph exclaimed, all is lost. What shall I do? And he began weeping and sobbing and moaning and pacing the floor. He and Martin knew how sacred the record was. They knew how sacred the trust was the Lord had placed in them. Martin knew that he had disobeyed the Lord and broken the covenant he made. He showed the manuscript to many more people than he had promised. Joseph was sure that he had made a grave mistake by wearying the Lord with his request on behalf of Martin. They both felt their salvation and calling was lost, and there's nothing that they could do. Have you ever felt like this? Have you ever felt like, I've fallen so far, I've made a big mistake, and there's nothing I could do? How will the Lord ever forgive me? Like you can't fix whatever was done? Well, 
uh, the situation might be hopeless. That's how you feel. Joseph's mother encouraged him to repent, and perhaps the Lord would be merciful and forgiving. So Joseph left that evening, and he went back home to Harmony. When he arrived home, the angel Moroni appeared to him and took the plates. So now he lost the interpreters and the plates. For that next month, Joseph fell in darkness from mid-June mid through July. He fell in darkness, and he went through a hard time. After sincerely repenting for several weeks, Joseph's prayers were answered. Moroni reappeared and gave him back the translators. And he told him that if he repented fully, the plates would be returned to him September 22nd of that year, 1828. Joseph, through the interpreters, received the revelation that we find in Doctrine and Covenants section 3, where he was sharply reprimanded and told the work of the Lord can't be frustrated, but that if he repented, his gift and calling to translate would be restored. He was told that the course of the Lord was one eternal round, but does he understood? did he understand at that time what it meant? Well, in September, Joseph received the plates again, and the translation resumed with Emma's as scribe, right exactly where they had left off, which is the start of the book of Mosiah, continuing in those same large plates. The Lord instructed him not to retranslate any of what was lost, explaining that evil men had altered the manuscript and were laying a trap to discredit the work. He told him this the following spring. We don't know exactly when Joseph realized that there was a backup plan, but he went for some time not knowing. So he starts translating to Mosiah, and he thinks that everything they had translated in the book of Lehi, the story of the migration, the story of the brass plates, that all of that had been lost. In April 1829, Joseph received that revelation in Doctrine and Covenants section 10, and he's told that another account of the same part of the Book of Mormon was on the plates of Nephi, which he had yet still to translate. By summer, almost a year after the manuscript was lost, Joseph and Emma were now living at the Whitmer Farm in New York. The book Saints then represents what happens this way. Quote, he was now translating the last part of the record known as the small plates of Nephi, which would actually serve as the beginning of the book. Revealing a history similar to the one he and Martin had translated and lost, the small plates told of a young man named Nephi whose family God had guided from Jerusalem to a new promised land. It explained the origins of the record and the early struggles between the Nephite and Lamanite peoples. More importantly, it bore a powerful testimony of Jesus Christ and his atonement. When Joseph translated the writing on the final plate, he found that it explained the record's purpose and gave it a title, the Book of Mormon, after the ancient prophet historian who compiled the book. So now Joseph knew that there was a backup plan. And that's when he translated it. He took that last page and it became the title page. Now, when did Joseph, we don't know exactly when Joseph figured out that there was a backup plan. And that kind of applies to us too, doesn't it, sometimes? We might make a mistake and we didn't know that the Lord knew what we were going to do and that he has a plan for us to repent and return. But he does. Joseph had to move forward with faith, being obedient. But in the end, Joseph and we can see the Lord his hand was in it from the beginning. He prepared the way for his work to go forward perfectly. Joseph and Martin both repented and became more willing, more obedient, faithful servants. And the version of the Book of Mormon we have is exactly what the Lord wanted us to have. Can you see how he prepared the way? First, he had Nephi create a second set of plates 2,000 years before. He told him to keep two sets of plates. And Nephi said, the Lord has me do this for a wise purpose, which I know not. Now on those plates, Nephi and the subsequent prophets wrote their most precious experiences, their testimonies, their revelations, the visions they had of Christ. They were the most precious portion. Second, when Mosiah took over the plates, the Lord told him, don't worry about the second set anymore. Just stay on the large plates. The Lord knew it wouldn't be needed past that. So that's what he did with Mosiah. The third thing that shows us that's the example is that Mormon and Moroni were then inspired to take those small plates when they found them in part of their abridged record and put them at the end of the plates. And, and that, had they put them at the beginning, that would have been the portion lost where he knew Joseph would find it and put it at the start of the Book of Mormon. 
And finally, the Lord preserved those plates for over 1,400 years, allowing us to have the Book of Mormon the way we do today. So now think of what the implications are for you, going back to where you are in your life, or where you might be, or what problems you might have to accomplish. It shows that the Lord could work and set the groundwork and prepare the way over 2,000 years before what would take place actually happened. Like Joseph, we might not see the path that the Lord's prepared for us, but if we move forward, we'll find it. He'll show it to us and make it clear to us. We still have to make the, the choice. We still have to be worthy to hear his guidance and do the work that's required. We have to be repentant and humble, but the way is prepared, and we can have the Spirit to guide us to it. We can win the battle with the adversary if we keep repenting, listening, and following the Spirit. The Lord will change us and take our mistakes from us and turn them into strengths. It's hard to repent, but it's harder not to. We have to choose our heart and become what the Lord wants us to, letting the heat of our experiences, combined with the love and the comfort of the Atonement of Jesus Christ, purify us. I pray that we might become like Alma and his son, Alma the Younger, like Enos, the sons of Mosiah, the Apostle Paul, and so many others who have truly been converted and changed from the natural man to who they were supposed to be. Like them, the Lord can take us, even in our weaknesses, and make us strong tools to accomplish his mighty works. My friends, never give up. It's not too late to repent, to find the path that the Lord has given for you in return. He will run to help you. He'll strengthen you to endure the trials of this life. He will purify you through his experience and his spirit. And when you look back, you'll see his hand has prepared you all the way in every step. I know that the Lord prepared the way for me to come to Ensign College. I can look back and see his hand guiding me through hard times in my life. I can see that I am the person I am today, not in spite of my weaknesses, but because of them, and that as I turn to the Lord, he's made them strong for me and blessed my life. I know Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ live. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is true. It's led by a prophet, Russell M. Nelson, who is guided by them. May we choose our heart and come unto Christ and become his capable and trusted disciples. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.